right. Okay, so let's get back to work. We're gonna pick up where we left off last time. So here's my goal today. I'm gonna do a little, we're gonna do a little more, and then I'm gonna stop early, and then I'm gonna get you guys to help each other because I want everyone to get to the place where we are, right? Some of you guys are halfway there, others all the way there. Some of you are pretty close to the starting line. Um, that's okay. Um, I know we've been going kind of fast, but um, but at this point, I'm, I'm confident that I can get everyone to where we're about to go uh, with some help from each other and also from me. So that's that's today. Okay, so where we left off last time. So we had set up our um, we had set up our, our Kotlin project, and where we got to last time was we added uh, a dependency on Ktor, which was the library that we're going to use to build our web API. And we had constructed, we had, we had filled out a couple of routes, right? We hadn't really done too much yet. We had had a route, um, the root route re returning just some text, um, hello world, and then we had a route that returned um, the sum of two numbers, right? So if I take this code and I run it, all right, I've got this, this warning message, but that's okay. Uh, it's less scary than it looks. And then I go to localhost 8080. Why is it? Oh, sorry, 8008, or whatever the port number is that you use. I see hello world, and if I try the other path, I should see the result of adding these two numbers together. Um, if I go to paths that don't exist, if I try to get this invalid arguments, I'm gonna get a 400 error, it's a bad request, that's what I want. Um, and then if I go to routes that don't exist, I get a 4 over. Right. So this is, this is where we stopped. Okay, so two goals today, um, things that we're gonna try to do quickly. One is, to start using JSON in our product, right? So um, who here thinks they can explain to me what JSON is and why it's important? David, want to take a crack at it? Yeah, so on some level, you can think of a JSON object as like a map, right? But, but why do we use it? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take a couple of pieces from that answer. So one is that JSON is readable. I'm not gonna argue it's easy to read. Um, it is readable. It's also possible to write it. JSON is actually a terrible format to write by hand though, so don't ever do that. But um, so compared with, so, so, so the, the problem here or the opportunity is that we would like to have a way for two things to communicate with each other. We'd like to have a way for our little addition API to provide results in a way that can be consumed by lots of different clients. Okay, so JSON, despite the fact that it stands for JavaScript Object Notation, has been widely uh, adopted by pretty much every existing programming language. So I'm pretty sure there is a JSON library for every single programming language that you guys will ever use, right? Um, and this means that if we expose information from our little adder API via JSON, then any piece of software or pieces of software written in any language will be able to use it. So I'll be able to write a Python client that uses this API, or a Haskell client, or a client in Rust, or insert your language here, right? I mean, pretty much every, LaTeX probably does not have a JSON interface, but LaTeX's not a programming language, uh, so we can ignore it. Um, but anyway, pretty much anything out there has it. So this has become a, a, a really popular standard. It's not the only one, there are others. Uh, there's something called XML. Has anyone ever seen XML before? Maybe when working with Android? Yeah, XML uh, would also work. Uh, XML has sort of fallen out of favor a little bit. Um, anyone who's looked at both XML and JSON want to compare or contrast in terms of usability? 
What's one of the things about XML that you think maybe means it's not quite as popular as it used to be? Yeah. You know, the syntax is more, is more complicated, but it's also like, it's sometimes people describe XML as being chatty. It's a lot of crap in there. It's like really verbose. If I just want to return a couple of values, I end up with lots of characters, right? And so it's more difficult for humans to read. It's possible to read XML, right? If you've done some Android development, you might have even written XML from time to time. Um, you know, people write HTML by hand as well. I don't recommend that, I think it's a bad idea, but you can. Um, in comparison though, JSON ends up looking a lot cleaner, right? And it's, it's more readable, right? We'll see some in a minute. All right, so who here is sick in 126? Do you guys, so can someone explain the JSON assignment to me? Do you guys actually? Okay. Okay. Okay, so that sounds sane. I was worried, so I've, I've seen classes where they actually have people write a JSON parser by hand, okay? Do not do this, right? I've seen people generate JSON by hand. Do not do that either, right? It's just, okay, sorry, well, there we go. Points off, <laughs> 26 gets a C for making you generate JSON by hand. Not incorrect, right? Um, there are tools to do this for you. I'm gonna show you how to use one. All right, so let's add, uh, so, so, so Ktor has support for this. Ktor has several different ways that you can both accept JSON incoming into your application. We'll show you how to do that uh, maybe next week. And you can also generate JSON from your application in a very easy way, right? You can find several different approaches to doing this. The one that I'm gonna use because I think it's the nicest and harsh agrees with me is JSON. So if we Google Ktor JSON, we're gonna find how to set this up on Ktor's um, always terrible documentation website. Um, so there's two things we have to do here. So this is, um, this is something that in order to use as part of our project, we need to add to our build.gradle file. So Ktor, um, you know, so right now we have sort of the core Ktor dependencies installed. What we're doing now is we're adding a feature, right? And so Ktor exposes these different features through different packages. And so if we want to use this as part of our application, the first thing we need to do is grab this uh, dependency that it has here. I'm gonna put that here in my, and I to correct because we're using camel case. I don't know what their problem is with that, but anyway. And let's hit refresh. Okay, so that seemed to work. All right, so now this is pretty much all we have to do, but we have to figure out where to put this block. So what this is doing is this is configuring our, our web application, our web API, to be able to, again, both accept and return JSON from our calls. Okay, so let's do that. Now, where did we configure our web server here? So remember, this block right here is because this configuration block. It starts here, and it ends down here. In a minute, we're actually gonna factor this out into a separate function so that we can test it. But for now, this closure contains the configuration for a server. This tells, um, this tells Ktor about the routes that I'm using. Now what I want to do is install this, um, this feature. So I'm going to do, again, I'm pretty much uh, borrowing like this. I need to import. Okay. I'm going to do. And then inside this block, if you wanted to configure JSON, you could do it in here. I need to import that as well. I should be able to do that because I just added that package. Okay. So now what I'm doing is throughout my application, I'm going to be able to both accept and return JSON, okay? But the question is JSON what, right? JSON from what object, okay? So, so here's, here's what's supposed to be the magic behind JSON. JSON is supposed to allow me to take an object, an instance of a class, and convert it into a string that then some other piece of software can convert back into an object of a different type, right, or in a different language. So for example, here I'm using Kotlin. I can use a Kotlin class, serialize it, and then your uh, Java program could deserialize it into an object. 
or your Python program to deserialize into an object. So I need a class to do this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take our example right now that is currently returning a string, and we're going to modify it to return an object that contains all of the information about what we did. So let's define that up here, and this is Kotlin, so I can create a data class very easily. Um, I'm going to call this add result. I'm going to give it two, sorry, two integer parameters, and then a result. And remember, nope. Remember in Kotlin, this is all I need to do to define a class. This class has three instance variables. They're all integers, first, second, and result. So what I'm going to re want to return from this call now is an instance of add result that contains both integers that were sent in through the call and then the result. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do down here is I'm going to create an instance of my add result class. I'm going to use these variables that I had defined, and I'm just going to store their result here. All right. So now, I've got to figure out, so now I have an object. And now what I want to be able to do is something that's known as serialization. I want to be able to take this object and convert it into a string. This is called serializing it. I'm going to serialize it into JSON. Now, you could, you could write your own little function to do this, okay? But that would be bad, okay, with a capital B, and dumb, and also a waste of time. Because one of the things that JSON will do for you is it will do this, okay? It understands how to do this. So let's see how we use this with, with Ktool. It's actually pretty nice. So all we need to do is respond to the request with an instance of that object. Right, so before I was adding the two and converting it to a string and returning text, now I'm returning a reference to an object. Right, so I created that object here, I passed in values to the constructor, I got a reference back, and I'm calling respond, I'm sending that back to you. All right, so let's see what actually happens here. Let's stop, stop this, I'm gonna rerun my web server. I'm gonna go back here, and we're gonna look at what happens all right. Now yours might look a little different than mine. I have a plugin installed for Chrome that formats JSON nicely, so yours might look like all in one line or something like that, right? Um, but look what we got back, right? That's valid JSON, and it looks like the object that we sent in. Okay, we did like zero work there. Okay. So how does this work? Anybody want to venture a guess? Java hackers in the room have some idea about how, I mean, clearly, like, JSON is doing this somehow. Right? So how do we get such a nice result here? Magic. And again, I didn't, I didn't provide any information on this class in order to, to accomplish this. Do we want to take a guess? Yeah, probably maybe too hard of a question. So Java has a way for classes to uh, examine their contents. That's called reflection. So what JSON does is it takes our object and it uses reflection to figure out what the names of the fields are and what their types are, and then it uses that to build this JSON string in a way that's appropriate to whatever data is in it, right? Um, if I wanted to, if I change this a little bit, let's say I return the result is a string for some reason. Let's go down here and convert this to a string so that it's, if I restart, if I restart my server, rerun the request, now I get a string, right? So JSON knows that integer types can live outside a string and JSON and string types should not. Um, and you can actually, um, serialize and deserialize fairly complex uh, structures using this library without having to do any work. 
Now, if you start using this, you guys will probably use this for your project in the class. There are cases where if you give it certain types of objects, it doesn't know what to do, right? There are certain types of objects that don't serialize easily, and so you need to potentially help it, right? Here I'm using uh, the members of my, the instance variables here are objects that serialize quite easily, right? These are integers and strings, right? Um, and so JSON can do this. Okay, so that was goal number one for today. Um, and when we, when we come back to this next week, we'll look at ways that you can accept requests in JSON, right? And that's when things actually start to get really interesting because then I can accept things that start to feel a lot more like a method call, right, and response. All right, what have we been not been, what have we not been doing recently that we really should be doing? Something that makes us feel good, something that makes us feel like a good software developer. Okay. Kate, oh, let's do that, that's a good point. Yeah, let's run the formatter. That always makes me feel good. All right, so we can run our formatting task. Okay, sweet, that makes me feel better just knowing that everything is properly formatted. What else, David? Yeah, writing some tests, okay. All right, so let's write, let's write some tests. Um, so if you, if you look up how to test, um, you know, uh, KTOR applications, what we've been doing right now is a form of experimentation, but this does not represent testing. This is just something you do as you're going to figure out whether or not things are working properly. Right? There is a way to write tests against um, our KTOR servers, but the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to change this code a little bit to make this possible. So currently what's happening is we're passing in a closure to this embedded server uh, call that contains the description of our application. And what we need to do is we need to move that into its own function so that we can test it. So here's what this is gonna look like. And we'll explain, I'll explain this in a minute. I'm gonna do function application, I wanna import that. I can call it whatever I want, I'm gonna call it adder. And now what I do is I move all of the I move all of the code that was in there into this function. And this is all valid. Again, we're gonna talk about what this is in a second. Right. All right, so now I've refactored my code so that my uh, web server configuration lives um, in this module. And now what I need to do is when I need to start this up, I need to pass it a reference to my, my application. And this will now just admit. So essentially what we've done is we've just moved, rather than sort of hard coding the configuration into the call that we used to set up our server, we've refactored it into its own, into its own stuff. All right, so review from a couple weeks ago. What is this that we just wrote? This looks a little weird, right? It's a function definition, clearly, but what kind of function definition is it? And also, why can I, like, these, these are, you know, again, this is one of the fun things about comp, and these are all functions, right? Like, routing is a function. It's an anonymous function that takes a single parameter. Install is a function. It's a function that takes two parameters. The first one is, I think this is an enum, and this is a closure. This is a function that, a higher order function that just takes a closure. My route configurations are functions that take a path and then a closure. Right? Um, but what is this top level function that starts at line 19? Why have I defined it in this particular way? Anybody remember from our discussion of functions what kind of what kind of function this is? So let me let me change it a little bit. Let's say I just thought, okay, I'm just gonna put the configuration into its own method. That's cool. Let me do this. Okay. So now look at this. Now I can't, like none of these methods can be called anymore, okay? So if I just try to make this a bare function, this doesn't work. What am I doing when I add back this application call? What, is, where, what role is application playing here? Yeah. Well, I, I imported that, that class, but what am I doing here? 
is one of these unique features of Kotlin. You guys remember extension functions? So what I've done here is I've defined an extension function. So in Kotlin, I can add a function to an existing class. Application is a class. It's one of the KTOR classes. And the syntax is saying I'm adding a new function called adder to that class. When I add an extension function, I get access to all of its methods and functions. That's why I can do things like call install. I could also do this. This is also valid, right? All the calls to this, for example, this could be this.install. These are all methods that are defined on the application. I don't need to do that. All right, so so far it looks like, you know, you know what, what am I accomplishing here? I, I've kind of, now, you know, if you were setting up a real um, Kotlin server that you were gonna use, and again, we run several of these on the back end of, of CS125. Um, eventually, once this gets complex enough, it's nice to move it out of the main method and into its own file and stuff like that. So that's one reason to do this. But the real reason to do this is so that we can test it. Okay, so as usual, particularly when using KTOR, we're gonna Google, we're gonna Google testing, and then um, I will spare you some, some time and energy here hunting through the documentation, and I'll show you kind of how we're gonna do this. What we wanna do in our test is we wanna be able to simulate calls to the API, and then make assertions about what should happen. All right, so the first thing we need to do is that implies is to add this KTOR server test host dependency to the test scope of our project. How do we do that? We go over to build.gradle and we add it down here in the test dependency area. So we're gonna say test implementation. Got this, I need, you know, again, I apologize on behalf of KTOR. I need that and then I need the KTOR version at the end. And now I want to import this again. All right, so now let's go back to our testing code, which is over here. And you'll notice that um, the, I don't know why this is upset about hello. It's interesting, all right. Do I, do I still have a, something called hello? I do. Let's get rid of this testing class for now. Let's write a new test, although that makes me nervous. Okay, so the one of the one of the cool things we talked about this last time about about KTOR is that it so this configuration for our application it knows how to do things like return the results of calls like get and post requests. And then down here I'm attaching, at the very bottom in my main method, I'm attaching it to a server, like a little lightweight HTTP server that will actually accept requests from the outside. But when I test, I typically just want to test this internal part of my code. I don't really care about worrying about what port things run on and stuff like that. I really would just want to test the logic in here. So for example, I want to test that when I retrieve the root route, I get back something that returns hello. All right, so let's go in here and, all right, so the, let's get down here. Uh, this has gotten detached from my, let me try this, let's try deleting this guy. It. 
Let's see what time is it. All right. I'm not sure what's happening here. So you guys know that I actually do write tests. All right, I'm stuck. So here's here's the plan. Happens. Sorry, worked earlier. Um, so again, I will. So why don't we do this? I'd like everyone to get to the point where, not where you've written some tests, because I didn't get there myself, um, but where you you have two working routes on your server. One of them should work like this. Well, actually, let's go back and just fix this so it. This should be an int again. And then we'll just have this return physical second. That's fine. All right. So your, your server should have two working routes. One is an add route that does what you think. I need to restart this guy. Nope. Don't do that. Uh, there we go. Oh, IntelliJ. Let's try this. Yes. Validate caches and restart. Does that always fun? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Wrong port. I'll help. There we go. Okay. So add should work like this, and then your root route should return hello world. All right. How many people have this working? Raise your hand. Okay. If you have it working, find someone who doesn't have it working. Help them. If you don't have it working, you have 25 minutes. I am not going to share my code on GitHub. The point of this is not for you guys to clone my code and run it, right? That I know will work, right? I actually want you to be able to do this yourself. 